friends, Romans, countrymen, lend me your ears. Fridays are awesome. Shakespeare couldn't have said that any better. I'm Carl Azuz for CNN 10. We're grateful to have you wrapping up the week with us. We start with a milestone for the measles. This year, there have been at least 681 cases of the disease stretched across 22 U.S. states. That's the highest number on record since the measles was declared eliminated from the U.S. in the year 2000. Being eliminated doesn't mean it's completely gone. It means the country went more than 12 months without people continuously catching the disease. The U.S. Centers for Disease Control says the current outbreaks are linked to people who've traveled to other countries and brought the measles back with them. No one has died in the outbreaks. Most of the children who've been infected were not fully vaccinated against the measles, though some were and caught it anyway. The vaccine offered in America isn't just for the measles. It's called MMR, standing for measles, mumps, and rubella, the three diseases it aims to prevent. Doctors recommend two doses of this vaccine in early childhood. The CDC says there's a remote chance that the MMR vaccine can cause side effects and even serious injuries, which is why some parents are holding off on getting it for their children. But experts say the benefits of the vaccine outweigh its risks. Measles is highly contagious. Symptoms include high fevers, coughing, and a skin rash. 10 second trivia. Which of these US cities was founded in 1625? New Amsterdam, St. Augustine, Savannah, or Jamestown? What's now New York City was originally founded by 17th century Dutch settlers, hence the name New Amsterdam. In the late 17th century, what had become the city of New York had an estimated population of less than 8,000 people. Today, that population's more than 8 million. It's the most populated city in America. But that's not its only change. The island of Manhattan has grown, vertically, of course, with skyscrapers, but outwardly as well, as dirt and the garbage generated by all those people was used to expand the area they could live on. Today, we're joining a local architecture critic for a tour of New York City's ever-changing waterfront. We generally think of New York as having five boroughs, Manhattan, Brooklyn, Queens, the Bronx, and Staten Island. But there's really a sixth borough, and it's the largest, which is the water that connects the other five. So the first pier in New York started right here. Standing here, you don't really feel like you're in a maritime city. You don't feel like you're close to the water. But in New Amsterdam days, this was really the edge of Manhattan, and everything from here to what is now uh, the river is landfill. It's really the most profitable kind of recycling, was you take garbage, put it in the water, and turn it into real estate. One of the best places to get a sense of how the city has changed and the waterfront has changed is right here, Pier 15. It's a wonderful example of the way a relatively small, relatively modest design intervention can create a space people really didn't know about. So this is Swasson's Landing. This is the uh, entry point to Governor's Island. If you take the ferry from Manhattan, it's just a five minute ferry ride. Everybody disembarks here and then finds uh, their ways to different points on the island. And there's a map which shows you the two parts of the island. The original Governor's Island, which was where the Dutch first settled, and then all of this is landfill. I'm here in Brooklyn Bridge Park, which is a wonderful place to tell the story of New York's tempestuous love affair with the water and the waterfront. And right where we're standing here was just an oily, polluted shoreline isolated behind chain link fences that you really couldn't access. It was really kind of an abandoned area of the city. Now, thanks to 20 years of, of landscaping, of reclamation, uh, this park is now full of people. It's a destination park, not just a neighborhood park. To me, this story of New York re-embracing its waterfront is a very optimistic one. It's not just about the waterfront, it's really about the idea of seeing some of the hardest hit areas of the city, some of the weaknesses, and finding the imagination and the long-term commitment to build something new.
Picking back up today on our Positive Athlete Series. It features people like Caden Westwick, a volleyball player in California. He's helping his community clean up from the very mudslide that destroyed his home and every possession he had in it. If you know someone like Caden, you can nominate him or her at CNN.com slash Positive Athlete. My name is Caden Westwick. I'm a junior at Santa Barbara High and I play volleyball. About a year ago, I lost the house I was renting in the mudslides. These boulders here are just remains of the actual mudslides. They came from pretty much everywhere, and these, I guess, were just rushing all around our house. I woke up all once to the house just shaking. Get out of here, get, get out, out of here, here. get out, out of here, here. Go, 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 go! Probably one of the scariest things I've ever witnessed. Um, I'm pretty lucky, actually, to have made it out. Um, this was my room, which got just totally wiped out this night. But this isn't an exaggeration. You were homeless. Yeah, I think we lived in 10 different houses ever since until we finally settled. Tragedy happens, and then all of a sudden he goes, oh, I'm going to go help out the community and help with the bucket brigade. I mean, that is just astounding. You know, it kind of gives me goosebumps. So now we get across over here. Right. I'll go back up over that side. So what the Bucket Brigade does is we're pretty much just restoring the trails that were almost completely destroyed after the mudslides and just making them accessible for people to use again. You can see on the trees the mudslide was like 15 feet high. You can see the mark of the mud and um, we pretty much just went in there and tried to clear it all out. Actually, I'll use this tool. I lost, well, for one, just my school backpack, all my textbooks. Um, I mean, everything in my room, all my clothes, my bed. I mean, even just stuff that I like to use, like my camera, um, sports, like volleyballs, sports equipment. It's a little challenging, but um, it's pretty rewarding just because I feel like I'm helping the community after all the help that they gave me. Part of Lincoln, California, thousands of sheep are typically brought in to chew up grassland before fire season begins. But when a neighboring resident opened his backyard gate to let his kids get a look, oh, this is a huge mistake. The sheep came a running in. Now, there are worse things than having a yard full of ruminants. They're really only threatening the grass. But there were many of them, and for a while, they weren't going anywhere. Finally, when Scott Russo assumed the role of shepherd and led them back through the gate, while his wife jumped on the trampoline and shook a tambourine, the sheep retreated. Of course, the gate is now in sheep shape, and the shepherd broke a sweater to make them evacuate. It was like a floodgate to a bad bovid date. They went fleeting all while bleating in a pretty sheepish state. Is the grass greener? Well, we guess it all depends when a woolly stubborn flock flocks to a residence. What a way to end a week. What a need to mend a fence. We are dropping sick bleats on CNN 10. I'm Carlos Zeus.